so much. That's wonderful. Amen. Nothing like fellowship, is there? Yes, Nothing like that at all. Thank God for it. Well, I hope you've had a good afternoon. My wife and I thoroughly enjoyed Pastor and his family. A good meal, better fellowship, and thank the Lord for it. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for putting up with me. And uh, I want to say something before I get into the message. Go ahead and turn to Ephesians 5, if you would. But I, I want you to do something, and I'm not trying to be magnanimous or anything of that nature, but God's so gracious to my wife and I. He takes care of us beyond belief. Amen. And I want you to concentrate on this young mission couple back here. And as you give offerings and things of that nature, pay attention to them, would you please? and give bountifully to them. And I want you to do something. I want to say this on their behalf, and certainly not that they promoted or anything of this nature, but I love missions. I love missionaries. I surrendered to the mission field twice, and God wouldn't take me either time, <laughs> but he's let me be to 26 different countries because of missions. And I have a great heart for missionaries. And among them, I have a nephew that is in Verona, Italy, and a missionary there, and God has hands it on him, and, and I have learned the life, and we just have a grandson that just got back from being a missionary in Cambodia, and um, they have needs they'll never mention, and please pray about supporting them and being part of their ministry. I'm talking about on a personal level and uh, help them and their needs be met. When they get on the mission field, they shouldn't have to worry about their living. And uh, so you're the answer to that. So give gladly and heartily and prayerfully, if you would please. And I just spoke to them a little bit this morning, and uh, I found out just in that brief time that uh, they're my kind of people, and I love them, appreciate them, and and I've committed myself to pray for them Amen. while they're on the field. And I mean that, brother and sister Ray. God bless your hearts. All right, take your Bible. Let's turn to Ephesians 5. We're going to pick up where we left off this morning. We left off uh, down here at verse 23 as the husband would be the Savior of the body. We talked about what that Savior was, one who gives the total sum of himself for the full benefit of others. That's what Christ is, and the, the Bible, P, Paul is using this as an example, telling us this, as Christ is the Savior of the church, the husband would be as the Savior of the body or of the family of his marriage and that unit. Now let's get something kind of in order in our minds here tonight, if, we, if you would please. In specific, Paul is not talking about marriage in itself. What he's doing, he is using marriage through the Holy Spirit as a type of the local church, the believer, and their relationship to the church into Christ. And their usability and the parts they play and things of this nature. And he uses the analogy of husbands and wives. That's pretty neat, I think. And uh, so I'm using it as Paul is teaching it, the character of marriage, husbands and wives, and how to have a good Christian and a godly home. If you would please, it was something on this, on this plane. Remember when Jesus was on the earth and he would be teaching, he would say, uh, I say a parable, or I speak a parable to you. Now the simplest definition of parable is an earthly truth tied to a heavenly truth, or an earth action to a heavenly truth. And here we have kind of a parable without him saying it is a parable. He's using an earthly story to show us a divine truth. And so as we get into this thing, we saw several ingredients this morning from the seriousness and the spirituality and the control of the Spirit in our life to happiness and thanksgiving, some mission to one another, and then we got into starting to be into the individuality of our relationship, and that is women to be submissive to their husbands as unto the Lord. 
and we made sure, and I hope that you got this and gather this, that in that submission, in verse 21, he talks about dual submission, that we're to submit one to another. I am submit to my wife as her role is played out that makes the marriage, and I, I'm to know what my responsibility does, and I submit to that. And as a result of that, we have <laughs> dual submission to biblical authority in our home, and God then designs our marriage and our relationship and our home through that submission. Now, the Bible has designed, and you can go clear back to the fall of man, and when God says, it's not good that man should be alone, I'll make a help meet for him. You, you've read that. And how, because of the subtlety of Satan and Eve fell, God put all of the leadership of the marriage relationship in the home upon the husband. And that relationship or that submission is established upon one thing, and that is that the husband leads through biblical principle. And God never asked any of us at any time in our life to ever submit to sin, regardless of who demands it of us. We're only to submit to the authority of the holiness of God, that which honors Jesus Christ. So in relationships, let me stop and back up out of marriage into courtship. And I don't know, I, now I've got a mess of kids in our home, I know that. And uh, they're getting married and having kids, and, and we're loving all that part of it. And my wife and I began way back when our children were just little bitty boys, and we began to pray that God would give them good wives and things of that nature. And to this day, I'm thankful to God that He has answered that prayer. God has given us five wonderful daughters-in-law, and they all call us mom and dad, and we love them as our, our daughters. They're not... I tell them all the time, and even the kids that are getting married, we, I, we don't have in-laws. We just have a, another daughter or another son, a grandson, whatever that is. And I've got a wedding coming up in December with one of our grandsons, and I just counseled them in premarital counseling. And um, uh, I let Bryn know, you're not an in, in-law to us. You are our granddaughter. And... Uh, there's a good chance if they're kind of a little bend comes in your relationship, we're going to kind of jump board and we're going to be encouraging our granddaughter. And, uh, but the leadership God has placed upon the authority of the husband doing what is biblically correct. And the wife, it's earned in verse 20. Two, when it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Verse 22 and verse 33 gives us two things that the wife is to do, and we're going to come upon this here in just a little while. But it says, wives, see that you reverence your husband. And we're going to deal with that at the, at the closing part of our lesson tonight. But God says you're to submit to your husband. You are to revere your husband. Now, you're not to submit to that which is not honorable, and you cannot revere that which is not honorable. So there is a tremendous amount of responsibility put upon husband's leadership. Now, listen to me. There are myriads of books on how to. I mean, you just go to a bookstore, and you can even Google it. You know, and somebody's writing something on everything. And uh, here's what concerns me about that. And I'm not saying there's not help there, there's not good books. I'm not saying that. But sometimes we put greater authority on man's thoughts than we do on the infallible authority of God's Word. Amen. And I want to encourage everyone here, keep reading if it's good stuff and if it honors God, but make sure that you listen to the voice of God in the instruction of how you're to handle your life. After all, now listen, this, this life is not about you. That's true. This life is about Him. God is to get all the honor, all the praise, whatever it is. Now God, now listen, God does not call everyone to ministry. But God does call everyone to minister in whatever walk of life that He places them in. 
make sure that Christ is seen as the center of everyone's activities, whatever they are. If you're going to be a ditch digger, make it deep, long, and straight to the glory of God. Honor God in it. So now let's pick up and let's go beyond verse 23 and let's see what else that God gives us through the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus and he uses the marriage as a as an example for us to follow. Father, help us, we pray, as we give our thoughts, our mind, our heart, our ability to you. And Father, I pray that I'd be a good teacher, that you would wrap me tight in the mantle of my calling. And Father, grab the attention of these people. Father, you know what's in the heart, what's in the home. And Lord, I pray that you would use me to deal with this subject, that a difference would be made to individuals, marriages, homes, and Father, to this church, and for Christ's sake. And I'll praise you for it in your name. Amen. All right, let's look, if you would please, at verse 24. And we pick up again. Uh, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, that doesn't mean that women are second class line of people at all. God just says, here's my order. and this is, this is how I have laid it out. Listen, when you and I, when you and I act independent of God's way, we step out of the will of God. And we substitute the best, the best for something less. Remember many years ago, and of course the children don't remember this, but if you have a little bit of age on you, you probably remember when Sears, and it used to be Sears Roebuck, and they used to advertise everything they had this way. Good, better, best. They had three classes of materials. You could either just get good, or you could get a little better, or you could buy the best. It is amazing to me, it's amazing to me, that men and women that can have the best settle for good when you can have the best. See, let me tell you this. My wife I, and we had a couple of people this morning ask us our secret of 57 years. And I'll be very honest with you, it is, it's so hard for me to realize that I am old enough to be married 57 years. And I don't know how I got from that point to this point so fast. And just hang on, you're on the same journey, and one of these days you'll woke up and you won't have black hair there then. And uh, you'll say, what happened? Well, you got old, that's what you did. And I used to watch old men dribble on a suit coat. Now I do that. <laughs> and uh, I just found a spot tonight from lunch. And so here's what I just do to it. I don't worry about it. I just leave it hang around. And then when I get hungry for a snack, I just lick on the front of my suit. <laughs> and it pretty well takes care of dry cleaning as well. So here we are in this verse. Husbands, uh, it says, therefore, it's the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So verse 24 is tied directly to verse 22 in submission. But there again, and I'm not going to lay an egg and try to hatch it. I'm just going to remind you of this, that all of that is contingent. Again, it's contingent upon biblical leadership. The husband giving himself to the authority of the Word of God and leading his home in a biblical standard. And we have no secret to 57 years. Our truth is this. We've never taken our eye off of him and we've never taken our eye off of one another. She's still my girlfriend. I still date her. I still take her out on dates. I still write little love notes to her. And if I'm not going to be with her for a little while and we're separated, I make sure that I leave a note on her pillow. And it's something like this. I love you. Do you love me? Check one. Yes or no. XOXOXO. And we just stay with our attention on each other. There's no one, there's not another woman in the world 
that can do for me what she has willingly done for 57 years. And five times she stepped into death's door to deliver to me five young babies that call me dad. And why would I betray her and that for something that's counterfeit when I have the real thing? And if you live with that kind of a standard and you seek God's Word and His truth in your life, you will have you will have gangbusters for a time of wedding. You'll never lose the sweetness. You'll never lose the joy. You'll never lose the reality that when you're separated from one another, you get lonely for one another. And she and I reached the age where we're really kind of on borrowed time, if you read the Bible. And we know and we live this reality. I cannot, I cannot imagine my life absent of her. I can't. But I live in a time of reality as well that I know that there's a high likelihood that one of us is going to outlive the other. We're going to have to accept that. So why would I want to waste this time on something that she gives me every day of my life? Never let your days go by that you don't hold each other and say, I love you. And you know, kissing is legal. <laughs> and uh, not only is it fun, it's thrilling. And I, I tell her every once in a while, babe, I, I get as more of a kick out of kissing you today than I did then. And you know what? This is, this is really, I don't know how you're going to take this, but I love to kiss her in public. <laughs> and, and the reason I do that is people can't believe two old white other people can do that. <laughs> well, I haven't lost my pucker yet. <laughs> I want to lead this lady. Now listen, I want to always lead her to what's right. But I have five young men that look at me. I can't fail them because they are leading their family. And now their family is getting married and giving them grandchildren and us great-grandchildren. That chain can get very lengthy. And I, I cannot be so selfish within myself to break one link to lose another generation. I just cannot do that. And neither can you do that. And America, the world, can't afford that. So husbands, man, God has put a load on us. And when you chose to marry your sweetheart, you said, I do to God. I do accept my responsibility. I do accept the commands of God. I do accept the Word of God as the authority, and I'm going to do everything I can to lead my family and my home on biblical principle. Now you say, but what if my wife doesn't want leadership? That's her accountability and her loss. You cannot improve. You cannot improve on God's plan. Now let me throw this in here as I take another step. Those of you that are, have reached an age and you're thinking about, well, one day I'd like to be married. That's a healthy thought. Amen. And uh, I wouldn't begrudge you of that for anything in the world. But be careful what you watch, what you look at, what you listen to, and make sure you're a discerner of truth. <coughs> because there's some things, there's some things in life that's worse than being an old bachelor or an old maid. And I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. It's being married to the wrong person. Make sure they're in the Word of God. Make sure that they love Jesus. Make sure that because of that they're going to love you. And they're going to respond to your leadership and your surrender. So now let's look, if you would please, at verse 26. We have a collective ingredient here, and it's two things. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. There's two words there that I want to make sure that 
you understand that you're clarify and you put them actively in your daily life. Now listen, this is not just uh, abandoned to uh, marital bliss. This is a principle for life. And it's the word sanctify and it's the word washing by the water of the word. Let's consider the word sanctify. I said this morning that when my wife and I got married, that we knelt at our couch in our little bungalow and we gave our marriage and our home to Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to tell you is we sanctified it. We set it apart that it would be something different than normal and it would be something that God could use for His honor and to His glory. Sanctify it. Listen, when, and you say, well, uh, we've been married for years, we didn't do that. Now's the time. You can learn a truth and apply truth late. And I'll guarantee you this, when you finally set your house in order biblically, you're going to see a new home. You're going to see a new marriage. You're going to see something that you could have had all along if you just simply do things God's way. Let me give you this story, and I have several of them, but I want to give you these points and not keep you here too long. But I had, when I was in the pastorate, uh, for a number of years, when February came along, that was my home family children month. It was heart month, and so we taught Sunday school lessons on the family. We taught preach. I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday nights on the home in some aspect of marriage, of raising children, of loving one another, things of this nature. And I noticed at the beginning of the month, a husband and wife, I didn't know their husband and wife at the time, but they came in late. Service already started, and uh, they came in and they sat together, but they didn't sit close. They sat in the same pew, and they sat kind of a distance apart. They were there on a Sunday morning, and uh, they were back on a Sunday night. And then they were back on Wednesday. What I'm trying to say is they came every service for the entire month of February. But they left before anybody could get them. They never filled out a visit card. We didn't know who they were and we didn't know where they lived, so we couldn't make a visit on them. And uh, they would come in late, and as I was praying for their invitation, they'd sneak out. And so finally one day in March, and they were still coming, but they were still secret people. And... Uh, I noticed, I always check my, my appointment book when I go in, and my secretary had put on my date book two names that I never recognized. And when that time came, into my office walked that man and wife. And I said, oh, the elusive ones. And they laughed at me, and we just spent a little time talking. And finally I said, I'm sure you didn't come here just to pass the time. What's your reason of coming into my office? And the husband spoke and he said, we're married. He said, we've been married 23, 24 years. And he said, we have three sons and we are not getting along and we haven't been getting along. We live in the same house, but we live separate. And we made this commitment several years ago that when our youngest son turned 18, graduated from high school, we were going to get a divorce and said, we're in line for that. This was in March, and his, their son, the youngest son, graduated the last of that May, and said, we still intend to be divorced. Said, but we come by your church and was wondering why so many people were parked here. And said, we would take rides on Sunday. Said, we both have been saved. We are out of the will of God, and that's a confession. And he said, finally, one morning, we came by your church and packed with all those cars and said, one of us said to the other, and I wonder what in the world draws a bunch of people there. And the other one said, well, let's just go in one Sunday and find out. So we showed up the 1st of February, and of all things, you're preaching on family, home, and a marriage. And said, we want you to know that after we left that first Sunday, we got in my truck and we both looked at each other and made this statement. 
we'll never go back there. Said, <laughs> so, but oddly enough, Sunday night came and there we were. Wednesday night came, there we were. Said something was happening. And said, you made a statement and we want to know the truth of that statement. Said, the statement you made was this. You can give God the worst and He can make it into the best. Is that true? I said, yes, it is the truth. He said, even with a condemned marriage, I said, with anything. God can do anything but fail. He said, well, how does that work? I said, through knowledge, submission to that truth, and obedience to what that truth is saying. But you must be willing. He said, Pastor, would you counsel us? I counseled that couple for over three months. Sometimes I counseled her, sometimes I counseled him, and then lots and most of the times I counseled them together. You could see God begin to do the work. The first thing is He would open the door for her. The second thing is they got close together in the pew. Then He put His arm around her. And then He would just help her on with a coat and just little things. And one day, I knew I was getting close to the end. And things were changing in my, in my office. What was sitting before me was new. It wasn't what walked in my door. It was new. And finally, he said, Pastor said, I know that we're just about to the end of our counseling. And said, I want you to know that the counseling has made a huge difference. Said, it's really got us thinking. Said, but I want to tell you what happened this week. Said, one evening, said, we're sitting together. Said, we're in the same house, but we spend time together. That's new. And he said, uh, I looked over at her one night this past week and said, uh, when we get divorced, are you going to get married again? Said she thought for a few minutes and she said, yes, I am. I don't want to be alone. He said, I understand that. He said, have you thought who you would like to marry? What kind of guy you'd like to marry? And said, she was quiet for quite a while. And said, she said, yes, I have. He said, what kind of a man do you think you'll marry? She said, I would like to marry a man just like you. He said, but she turned the table on me. She said, are you going to get married when we get divorced? He said, yes. said, I'm like you. He said, I, I don't want to be alone. And she said, well, have you given thought to what kind of a woman you're going to marry? He said, yes, I have. And said, I really, I really know what kind of a woman I want to marry. She said, and what kind would that be? And he said, I want to marry a woman just like you. Said, and we looked at each other and kind of smiled and said, finally, we said, well, if we want to marry people just like us, why are we getting divorced? And he said, preacher, we want you to remarry us with us understanding what part the Bible is to play in our life. It wasn't legal but it was spiritual. And their three sons stood with them. 
There wasn't anybody in the auditorium. There wasn't anybody in the church. Just these two people, three sons, that recommitted their life to God. I left that church. I pastored now in southern Ohio. And a man died in that church where I had left. They asked me to come back and conduct his funeral. I did, and went in to use the restroom, and when I came out, there they stood, holding hands. And I asked them, I said, well, what an amazing surprise. I said, you act like you're in love. They said, it's not an act. It's real. And said, preacher, had we known what you have taught us, we would have never had trouble in the first place. Here it is in this verse. They learn what it meant to set their marriage apart. I'm asking you, would you consider, ever long how you've been married, would you consider husband and wife somewhere to do that in your home? I don't care how long you've been married. But see the value of saying, God, we give you our marriage. We want it set apart specifically that you can use it to your honor and to your glory. I tell you what, when you give God what you have, it becomes His treasure and He becomes very jealous of it. But now look what He says. If you're going to set it aside then it is to be washed by the water of the Word. Do you realize you find that twice in the New Testament? Once here and another time in John 15, in verse 3. There we find that he talks about the purity and the sanctification by the washing of the water of the Word. My dear friend, you and I must keep the Bible and its principles active in our life. It keeps us clean. It keeps us honorable. It keeps us separated. And it keeps us committed to that which we're to be committed to. You got it? Two things. Sanctified and kept clean. Now, look down at verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. There are several remarks I want to make on this verse. And I want you to listen very, very carefully to them. First of all, don't bring your past into the present unless it's something good. Don't use past failures as a means to get even today. If, if you're talking about an old boyfriend, an old girlfriend, why? You left them for a reason. Why would you want to bring them up now? If they were bums then, good chance they are they're bums now. <laughs> If they were no good then, chances are they're no good now. But here's the thing about it. They're not now in your life, regardless of what they have become. What is important now is now. What you have, who you're with, what God has given you, that is what is important now. Keep it clean. Keep it pure. Keep it honorable. And here's how you do it. Here is an ingredient that Baptists are afraid of. We're afraid that if we use this word, somebody's going to tag us holiness, Pentecostal, Church of God. It's none of those. It's a biblical, scriptural word. Look what he says in the last part of verse 27. But that it should be 
What's the next word, class? Holy. holy. Holy and without blemish. Do you realize that every sacrifice that's ever mentioned in the book of Leviticus, now I don't know how interested you've ever been in Leviticus. It takes a lot of patience to read it. But if you pay attention to every offering in Leviticus, it had to be without blemish. If there was any blemish in any of the offerings, it had to be discarded. If an animal was going to be sacrificed, they had to examine every part of that animal to make sure there was no blemishes in it before it could be sacrificed. Otherwise, it had to be declared holy. Why don't we do something like this? Why don't we be honest with ourselves in our relationships? And where we are wrong, man up that you're wrong. Don't be like Fip, Flip Wilson, and there that's age in me. But Flip Wilson used to say this all the time. The devil made me do it. You know what? I don't like him, the devil. Flip Wilson's dead. And I didn't care a whole lot for him. But anyway, here's what I found out. We blame the devil for a lot of things that the devil's not guilty of. We're at fault. The devil didn't make us do anything. The flesh made us do something. Because we're reasoning outside of biblical principle. And when we think outside of biblical principle, we always think selfishly. Now listen to this statement. All sin. Have you heard that part? All sin is a selfish problem. All sin is a selfish problem. Because every personal sin has to do with me. What I want. Selfishness. I don't care as dark and black and as deep as you can figure out a sin to be. It's selfish. It's about you. Holy. Allow me to ask you this. As you look at your marriage tonight, is it holy unto the Lord? Or is there spot and blemish? Is there too much of the failure of the past involved in the living of the present? It'll get you in trouble. It'll get you in trouble. God has given you a pastor. And in that pastor's calling, God has given him wisdom and discernment. That doesn't come automatic. That comes because he spends time on his knees. He spends times in the Word of God. He has set aside times when he and God get alone. And he spends time. God gives him those gifts. And I haven't asked him this, but I'm putting this on him because of his calling. Use him. When you start getting a little twist, a little balance, and you say something like this, I oh, will work this out. The devil won't let you work it out. If the devil can defeat you and defeat your marriage, he's won a victory. It's very difficult for a crippled man to die out of a, to crawl out of a deep hole. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need someone that's looking at it from a different perspective. Sometimes we need it when a hand reaches down and picks me up because I don't have the ability to do so myself. You don't believe there's biblical principle for that? Put this in your notes. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. There it is. There it is. You that are spiritual, when you see a brother fall into sin, you which are spiritual, go to him. You help them. 
Look what it says in this, that it should be holy and without blemish. That goes back to the washing of the Word. Purify the relationship. Now, let's look on verse 28. <clears throat> this is to the man again. So ought men to love their wives, and this is so strange. Now, before I complete that verse, have you ever had someone tell you or say something in this order? You're not to love yourself. I've heard people say that. I've heard preachers say that. We are not to love ourselves. Jesus must have been wrong. Paul must have misheard the inspiration. Read the rest of the verse. Look what it says. It says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Now look. He that loveth his wife loveth him Self. That's repeated down in just a few more verses. I have suspicion. Can I share it with you? I just feel like I need to unload it. Here it is. Here's my suspicion. A man or woman that does not love themselves will abuse others. Preacher shaking his head. I, I, I've seen it. I've seen men that cannot master the control of their own self, but they bring it out in what they do to those that they should love the most. When you cannot control your emotion and you take it out on the person that is to be the rest of you you don't love yourself see I want you to know tonight now are you listening to me did you see this old guy stand up here I love me now I'm not arrogant with that I'm not self-centered with that but what I mean by that is I don't like to hurt myself I don't enjoy pain. I thank God for pills. <laughs> I thank God for the surgeries that I've had. They'd say, they'd say, Mr. Green, what's your pain from 1 to 10? About 15. <laughs> you want a shot? Yeah, yeah, give me two. <laughs> I don't like pain. But I want to tell you something. Because I don't want to hurt, I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to hurt five boys. I don't want to hurt my daughters-in-law. I don't want to hurt my grandchildren. You get the picture. If I care for me, I'm going to know how to care for you. Don't argue with me. You read it. It's called self Love. It's not talking about arrogancy, pride, self-centeredness. It's not talking about that. It's talking about as God so loved, He gave. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. As I love my spouse, I love myself. That's what it's teaching there in verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth himself, or his, his wife, loveth himself. So now let's look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Two ingredients, and it's for the husband. Again, you are to nourish and you are to cherish your wife. So what it says, you are to love or you are to nourish and you are to cherish your wife, even as the Lord the church. So let's look at those two items just very, very quickly. You are to nourish. You are to provide 
for. Socially, spiritually, sexually, in every way you are the provider of the emotional needs of that relationship. It goes back to the word submission and reverence. They are earned, they are not dictated to. I remember in my counseling office, I had someone referenced to me. They were not members of my church. As a matter of fact, they were members of a different denomination. They'd been married for 18 years, and they had filed for divorce. They had the divorce proceedings already in hand. All they had to do was sign the papers. But someone recommended that they come and see me. And I counseled them for over four months. And God would work in their life. Finally, one night, the little lady spoke up and she said, Have you been talking to my father? I said, No. Why? She said, You know too much about me. I said, Isn't it amazing how God reveals things to you? But, that, but she was amazed. And towards the end, you could see God do His work. And that's the joy of it. She finally spoke up and she said, Brother Green, had I known these principles... Before we got married, I probably would not be married to this man. But because we have learned these together, we're talking. We're spending time together. We're reasoning together. And said, because of biblical truth, we're going to have a new marriage. I sat down in a funeral several years after this. They did not get a divorce. And I wasn't paying attention. My wife was with me. And when I sat down, someone tapped me on the shoulder. And it was that couple. And the preacher had already started the sermon, so they didn't disrupt. But I turned and saw who it was, and the wife went, And afterwards, she said, it's great. Listen, you cannot improve on God's standard. Why do we neglect and turn to the flesh and wind up in trouble every time when God has given us the best path to follow? So he says, you're to nourish, you're to provide in every way the needs. And then it says, cherish it. That's an intensified form of you loving Cherish her. When you cherish something, that is more than just love. It's beyond be description of love. And by the way, have you ever heard someone make this statement? True love cannot be defined. That is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> if 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 you cannot define it. How do you know it when you have it? It's like this. The word humble. Have you ever said, uh, well, if you, th if you think you're humble, you're not humble. But we're told to be humble. So if I'm to be humble, but I'm not to know that I'm humble, how do I know when I'm humble? <laughs> Somewhere there's got to be an understanding that you can understand your humbleness and not be arrogant, but be thankful. Love is defined in the Word of God, and no, it's not John 3, 16. 1 Corinthians 13, the first five verses. It tells us what love is, and it tells us what love is not. And if you want to know if you love your husband or if you love your wife, read that. It'll let you know. And if you read that and you start saying, well, I kind of agree with that part, but man, vaunteth not itself. Well, wait a minute. It just told me to love me. When you find a reference in your heart that's not in harmony with God's definition, it's right, you're wrong. And that's the point of work. Now, let's look on down here. 
And it says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Ownership. Husband, you're saved. Amen. Wife, you're saved. You get married, you become one flesh. We're going to look at that in here in just a second. So, since we are one flesh, who owns us? Well, Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 6, does he not? What? Know you not that you're bought the price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He bought you. Really, in truth, you and I have no rights of ourself. We only have rights with the one that owns us. He has dictatorial authority. Whom the Lord loveth, He... He takes you behind the woodshed and smacks around on you sometimes. He gets our attention. Now look what it says here. He owns us. Does he, have you ever realized God owns your home? God owns your marriage? God owns your wedding? God owns that. Keep your hands off of it. Quit trying to control what God is to control. Let me stop here long enough to ask something. Some of you are acting like you're watching paint dry. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Good. Verse 31. Here it is. The oneness of a relationship. For this cause, because of honor, because of ownership, because of the things we've discussed, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And that joined to means... That you're welded. You're stuck. You're not two. You're unbreakable. Years ago, I, I was traveling to the Philippines and I fell asleep with my neck against the fuselage of the plane. And when I woke up, I couldn't straighten my neck. I was bent for life, and I was in pain. I hurt. Well, when at that time I was president of a mission agency and, which catered to the Asian world, and when I got off, those little Filipinos saw me, and they felt sorry for me. So, oh, Dr. Green, Dr. Green, you need a massage. You need a massage. I didn't know they were finishing killing me. <laughs> But they would come and they, they would massage me. And it was getting worse and worse. I couldn't get outside the pain. It was, it was horrible. I had to come home and the, a little Filipino doctor operated on me. And uh, he said, that's a mess. And he said, how'd that happen? So I told him the story. And he said, no more, no more preacher. No more go to sleep on fuselage of plane. Get you in trouble. Well, I wish they'd have told me that before. But anyway, he operated on me and he fused my neck. He took a bone out of my hip and fused my neck. And finally I said, Doc, would you tell me what's the chances of me hurting myself in that fusion break? Never happen. Never happen. You may break above it, and you may break below it, but you'll never break that fusion. That neck has become one. I got married 57 years ago. We became welded. We became fused. We became one. When I hurt, she hurts. When she hurts, I hurt. And we have been married so long, we don't talk. We just know what everybody's thinking. And we nod. Yeah. We just agree. No, no. So we're not going to do that. But we're one. Are you truly one in your relationship? One people. One person. I don't try to live my life independent of her. I live my life with her. 
and she does the same thing. We try to be married to enjoy specific things but live separately. You can't do that. You just absolutely cannot do that. Get it right. Get help. But now look what he says in verse 32. Interesting thing. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So here we know that he is using the analogy of how marriages should be between a husband and wife so we can better understand what the believer's life is to Christ through the church. But now he says, there's a word there I want us to understand the best we can. How do you understand a mystery? If the church is a mystery, marriage is a mystery. Only God can clarify it. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. I found a good thing. And I let her know that, don't a baby? A lot and often. I t- ask her once in a while, I say, baby, did I tell you I love you too often? Oh, no. No. Keep it up. Keep it up. It's not redundancy, it's truth. Learn to love one another. Now, I'm going to give you a line. We're going to drop down to the last verse and we're going to close. But here's what I want you to put in your notes. In order for a marriage to work, you must work at the marriage. In order for a marriage to work, you must work at the marriage. No relationship grows rich on its own merit. When you stand before the preacher and he says, Will you, Brenda, Take Roger to be your lawfully wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forth, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and health, till death alone shall part you. And she says, I do. You know what she's been active in for 57 years? Doing. I said the same thing. Her daddy married us. He said, Roger, will you have Brenda to be your lawfully wedded wife? Went through. I said, I do. And we've been doing ever since. That's not a joke. That's not levity. That's reality. We give our life to do for one another. Now, look down here, if you would please, at verse 33. There's two ingredients, one for the man, one for the wife. First of all, it says... Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. There's the repeat of what we found up in another verse. As you love yourself, love her. I'm going to give you a challenge. Right now, I'm going to give you a challenge. Open your Bible to this chapter. And here's what I want you women to do. I want you to find the verse where it tells you to love your husband. When you find it, let me know. Anybody find it? It's not there. Why is that? Does it mean the wife is to love her husband? No. It means the husband is the pursuer of the relationship and it's bona fide by the fact that he loves his wife. For God so loved the world that he gave. And when the husband is a consistency in giving himself to the benefit of his wife, he becomes the savior of the body. Are you tying it together? But then it says, wives, look what it says in the conclusion. It says, wives... See that you reverence your husband. That's earned. You do not reverence dictatorial life. You reverence a man that leads with biblical principle with your heart in his hand. There's marriages here tonight. I don't even know the pastor's marriage other than what I've witnessed and I love what I've witnessed. But I want to tell you something. Some of you know in your heart that you have been given a restart today. 
in your home, in your marriage, a restart. And you need to start on your knees, first giving your life to Christ and then to your spouse, apologizing for things and asking for forgiveness to your spouse and turn to biblical principle and learn what Jesus said is His expectation for our homes. I'm close with this illustration. Had a young couple that was in my office. They had both been married prior to coming to our church. They were having a rough time. And in the process of counseling them, you can see brokenness begin in their life. And one evening in counseling them, I asked this question. It was a tough spot. I was having trouble, trouble getting through it. It's kind of like trying to find chicken teeth. You know, they don't exist. And finally, I looked at them and I said, What do you two want? What do you want? Why are you in here? Tell me, what do you want? And they both lifted her head up. She was crying. And he was hurt. And finally, it was almost like stereo. They said, we want a marriage like you and Mrs. Green have. We're not without fault. We're humans. But when you turn loose of your marriage together and give it to God, He'll give you the marriage that you want. Tomorrow, I'm going to preach on the four major causes of divorce. You fit in there somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you. And then I'll conclude tomorrow night after the four points on problem solving in a relationship. Tonight, what's in your heart to do? What's the Holy Spirit prompting you to do? Then that is what you need to do. Father, I love you. And thank you for the privilege of standing here. And I pray, dear God, that what we've said is going to make an eternal difference. Don't let people walk away from decision. May they desire right more than they do indifference. And Father, we're talking about revival. That's been mentioned. But Father, we need a renewing in our homes so that we can have a revival in our church. Moving hearts tonight, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name, Pastor.